Okay, so we'll go ahead and pick back up uh, with the fourth part of tonight's talk. And uh, just by way of review so far, in part one, we answered the question, why is it so important to establish the immateriality of the human soul? And we saw how by denying the immateriality of the human soul and reducing man merely to matter, it leads to all sorts of absurdities. And literally, you have to conclude with the absurdity of life if the human soul is not immaterial. In our second part, we offered an argument for the immateriality of the human soul from our human desire for and awareness of the five transcendentals, uh, perfection and completeness of knowledge or truth, love, goodness or justice, beauty and being. And part number three, uh, before our break, we looked at an argument for the immateriality of the human soul from human knowledge of forms. And we saw how by reducing the mind merely to matter leads to all sorts of absurdities and contradictions. So therefore, we conclude the human soul must be immortal, uh, excuse me, immaterial, and consequently, immortal. Okay, now we come to part four, and that is we're going to offer an argument for the immateriality of the human soul from near-death experiences, okay? Now, there are a few thoughts by way of introduction. Uh, first of all, the first thought is a word of caution. Uh, very often, near-death experiences are accounted for or, uh, or explained on a popular level. There are many popular sources of accounts of near-death experiences, okay? We're not considering those popular sources of near-death experiences. That's not the source to which we're looking. We're going to talk about near-death experiences uh, in light of some of the most scientifically and rigorously established medical studies on near-death experiences that are published in some of the most prestigious medical journals, thus giving us uh, reason to conclude with confidence that these near-death experiences are real, which would imply the survival of self-consciousness after bodily death, which implies the immateriality of the human soul. So, w w just a word of caution. We're not, we have to be aware of popular accounts, in which case some of those accounts might be flawed to v in varying degrees. It's simply anecdotal evidence and some of those popular accounts might have certain agendas behind them. But we're looking at medical studies that are rigorously established, published in prestigious medical journals. That's the source to which we're looking. Now, the second thought that comes to mind is basically the nature of these near-death experiences as evidence for the immateriality of the human soul. What we're going to look at does not prove the immateriality of the human soul as we did in a reasonable way, in a logical way, in the previous parts of tonight's reflection. However, these near-death experiences do corroborate very well with the philosophical arguments, right? It's sort of like converging evidence that corroborates with the philosophical arguments to lead us to the reasonable and responsible conclusion that the human being has a transphysical or transmaterial dimension. So it doesn't prove it, but it l points us in the right direction. And it's very, very interesting. In fact, I, w I would venture to say that it's very important to even start with the near-death experiences for a culture that is so scientifically set in its mind frame, right? Such a scientific bend to uh, the, the culture of today. It's, these near-death experiences are very important in evangelism for the immateriality of the human soul and trying to get that point across. For somebody, some, for somebody who is scientifically minded, this can serve as a good starting point, right? Because it's from empirical evidence, from medical studies. And then we complement and complete this with the philosophical arguments. Although in tonight's presentation, I started with philosophy, and now we're coming to the scientific approach. Now, so what is a near-death experience? Well, 
And near-death experience, first of all, is characterized uh, by a person uh, who is clinically dead, is experienced by a person who is clinically dead. And what we mean by clinically dead is that there is no electrical activity in the cortex of the brain, what they call a flat EEG, and there is no lower brain function, which is evident or indicated by fixed and dilated pupils and no gag reflex. So a person who is clinically dead, and the near-death experience is, is characterized by this person who is clinically dead having some sort of post-mortem capacity, such as the capacity for sight, for hearing, self-consciousness, and for memory. Also characterized by going to some other domain that's not of this physical world, passing through walls, right? Experiencing, de uh, encountering deceased loved ones, encountering a white light, and even in some cases, uh, what some people report to be Jesus, or God in, in the sense of the white light. So this is what a, what a near-death experience is. Now before we look at the four kinds of objective evidence for their near-death experiences, I want to simply introduce you to the major studies from which we're pulling this evidence. If you want a more detailed explanation of these major studies, you can visit Father Spitzer's website and the Magis Center uh, of Reason and Faith, Magis Center Reason, excuse me, magisreasonfaith.org or simply magiscenter.org and you click on the, the Encyclopedia for God and within that Wikipedia, Encyclopedia Online, uh, you'll find uh, these major studies in much more detail. First, the first major study is the Pim von Lommel study. Dr. von Lommel is a Dutch cardiologist who, with four other researchers, uh, carried out a longitudinal study of 344 cardiac patients who were successively resuscitated from cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals. And his major study was published in the most prestigious British medical journal, The Lancet, in 2000. So this is a major study that's credible that we can pull from for evidence for near-death experiences. The second major study is the Melvin Morse study. Dr. Morse is a Seattle-based pediatrician who has studied NDEs or near-death experiences in children as well as adults and he's the professor at the University of Washington Medical School. His research or his study involved 500 NDE patients, that is near-death experience patients, and was published in the prestigious British medical journal, The Lancet, as well as the American Medical Association's periodical, the American Journal of Diseases of Children, both in 1985 and in 1986. We also have the Kenneth Ring study. Kenneth Ring it is, is an American professor emeritus of psychology who published his research on the blind seeing during the near-death experiences. Dr. Raymond Moody study. Dr. Raymond Moody is an American psychologist and medical doctor famous for his longitudinal study of near-death experiences that spanned a little over 10 years involving over a thousand cases. His most famous title or work is entitled Life After Life. We also have the 1982 George Gallup Jr. study. A poll was taken in 1982 and discovered that approximately 8 million Americans, 8 million people in the, Uni in the United States, it had experienced or reported an experience of near-death experiences. And the point being that that's a large population to sort of take, you know, accurate data from in order to, pr uh, to produce these medical studies. And then you also have the Janice Holden study. Janice Holden is American is an American counselor and professor who researches NDEers or near-death experiences. She served as president of the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And she basically made a compendium of 107 cases in 39 different studies by 37 authors or author teams. And this took place, this compendium was published in 2007. And the, the, the emphasis or the aspect of her study that deserves highlight 
is the veridical evidence for the near-death experiences. That is, the verifiable aspects of these near-death experiences. That's what the Janice Holden study is known for. So these are the major studies that we're pulling from to sort of elucidate the four kinds of objective evidence for near-death experiences from these major studies. So let's look at our first kind of objective evidence. And that is veridical aspects of the near-death experiences. Veridical simply means verifiable. Veridical evidence refers to verifiable aspects. That is, certain unique occurrences that take place while the patient is clinically dead that can be verified after the fact after the patient is uh, brought back to life from clinical death, okay? So, for example, Von Lamo, Dr. Von Lamo reports how one man who had been clinically dead um, told a nurse after the fact, he recognized the nurse who had put his dentures in a particular location and told the nurse where she put his dentures because they couldn't find them. <laughs> So that's a unique occurrence that takes place while the patient is clinically dead and can be verified. He saw the nurse, he had the capacity of seeing the nurse place his dentures in a specific location and he could identify where it was. That aspect was verified after the fact. Another example, Dr. Melvin Morse reports how a woman had knowledge of a shoe on the ledge of a window of the fifth floor of the hospital hospital where she was being um being resuscitated. And that floor of on which the shoe was on the ledge was not the floor where she was being resuscitated at. And in fact, the psychologist by the name of uh, Kim Clark, who was interviewing this woman, actually crawled out on the ledge and affirmed that this weathered shoe was out there on the ledge of the window of a floor on the fifth floor of the hospital. A unique occurrence, needless to say, that could be verified by an independent objective source after the fact. Another example is reported by Dr. Raymond Moody. He explains how one patient reported seeing her daughter uh, wearing mismatched plaids <laughs> while she was in the waiting room while she was clinically dead, which apparently was a unique, uh, an extraordinary occurrence for her daughter. Apparently she was a fashion queen and that was something that didn't normally happen. But just the fact that this woman was able to see that while she was clinically dead and it was verified after the fact. Another example, Dr. Raymond Moody also explains how another woman overheard her brother-in-law talking to a business associate in a derogatory manner in the waiting room while she was clinically dead and was able to recount that conversation to the brother-in-law after the fact. Once again, another verifiable piece of evidence. And finally, in the Janice Holden study, which was unique because of all of the verifiable evidence, the veridical evidence, in the Janice Holden study of, remember the 107 cases uh, in 39 uh, different studies of 37 different authors, right? 8% of those 107 cases were inaccurate in regard to the veridical evidence. 37% were accurate to the T, so to speak. And the remaining 55% did not necessarily involve inaccuracy. It simply could not be completely verified by an independent objective source. And so it just simply wasn't taken into consideration. It wasn't counted. Okay? So you have a 37% accuracy within the 107 cases. And as many of these um, scientists will conclude, that is a, a large percentage in order to reasonably conclude that these near-death experiences are indeed taking place. Okay? Now, that's the, f that's the first kind of objective evidence, the veridical evidence, the verifiable aspects of the NDE. 
Now we move to the second kind of objective evidence and that is the blind seeing. Dr. Kenneth Ring, in his study, studied 31 patients, 31 blind patients, 21 of which had a near-death experience, 10 had simply an outer body experience. Not necessarily clinically dead, so it doesn't, doesn't classify as a near-death experience, but did have an outer body experience. And 80% of these 31 patients who either had a near-death experience or an outer body experience, 80% could see in their near-death experience or out-of-body experience. Here's what Dr. Ring writes. Among those narrating NDEs, not only did their experiences conform to the classic NDE pattern, but they did not even vary according to the specific site status of our respondents. That is, whether an nde -er was born blind or had lost his or her sight in later life, or even, as in a few of our cases, had some minimal light perception only, the NDE described were much the same. Furthermore, 80% of our 31 blind respondents claimed to be able to see during their NDEs or OBEs. OBEs referring to outer body experiences. And like Vicki and Brad often told us that they could see objects and persons in the physical world as well as features of other worldly settings, close quote. So Dr. Ring reports in his study, 80% of his patients could see in their near-death experience or outer body experience a capacity of sight that they don't have ordinarily in their body because they're physically blind. Now, in regard to the quality of perception, here's what Dr. Ring concludes. How well do our respondents find they can see during these episodes? We have, of course, already noted that the visual perceptions of Vicki and Brad were extremely clear and detailed, especially when they found themselves in the otherworldly portion of their near-death journey. While not all of our blind indie ears had clear articulated visual impressions, nevertheless, enough of them did, so that we can conclude that cases like Vicky's and Brad's are quite representative in this regard, close quote. So the perception of sight for these individuals who are experiencing the near-death experience or out-of-body out of experience is pretty much clear, okay? And that clarity of sight represents the whole in a general way. So the third kind of objective evidence for near-death experiences is the low to no death anxiety among NDEers. That is to say, those who experience near-death experiences have either a very, very low death anxiety or no death anxiety at all when compared to the general population. Or at least those who were clinically and, and also those who were clinically dead but didn't have a near-death experience. Here's what Dr. Melvin Morse writes. In, he's writing based upon his study of 500 NDE patients. He writes the following. We discovered that adults who have had near-death experiences as children have a much lower fear of death than people who have not had them. This was true whether they had vivid and wonderful memories of a flower-filled heaven or a brief and fleeting experience of light. Furthermore, the, the deeper their experience, the less they were afraid of death. This finding is in sharp contrast to people who have come close to death and survived, but were not fortunate enough to have had a near-death experience. They actually had a slightly higher death anxiety than normal. Thus, the long-term effects of NDEs can be measured with a fairly high degree of objectivity, and they stand in stark contrast to the general population." Close quote. So the fact that those who have near-death experiences have a low to no death anxiety rate compared to those who didn't have near-death experiences and even compared to the general population seems to point to the fact that these near-death experiences that are recounted are indeed real. That there has to be a cause, a sufficient explanation for this low to no death anxiety. 
And that sufficient explanation would seem to be their near-death experience, as Dr. Melvin Morse concludes. And finally, the fourth kind of objective evidence for the near-death experiences is the common characteristics among the NDEers. That is, common characteristics that are reported by those who have near-death experiences. So what you see on your handout and what I have here on the PowerPoint is a chart of the common characteristics and the percentage of experience among four of the major studies. The Von Lamo study, the Ken Kenneth Ring study, the Raymond Moody study, and the George Gallup Jr. study. So take, for example, the characteristic of an awareness of being dead. Vilamo reports 50%. George Gallup Jr. Uh, doesn't give us any percentage, nor does Kenneth Ring, but Raymond Moody affirmed the same characteristic in his studies. How about positive emotions or, or peace within this near-death experience? Von Lamo, 56%. Kenneth Ring, 60%. Dr. Moody affirms it. And the George Gallup Jr. poll, 32%. This is a common, characteristics, a common characteristic across the board. What about an out-of-body experience, like being aware that they are separated from their body. Von Lamo, 24%. Ring, 37%. Moody affirms it. George Gallup Jr., 26%. Moving through a tunnel is a common characteristic. 31% Von Lamo, 23% from Ring study, affirmed by Moody study, and only 9% from the poll of George Gallup Jr. Communication with light or beings of light. 23% in the Von Lamo study, 16% from Ring study affirmed by Moody, 14% in the George Gallup Jr. poll. Observation of a celestial landscape, 29% from Von Lamo study, 10% from Ring study affirmed by Dr. Moody, 32% from the George Gallup Jr. poll. Meeting a deceased person or other beings, 32% from Von Lamo affirmed by Moody. We have no statistics from Ring study nor the George Gallup Jr. And finally, life review. 13% from Von Lamo, affirmed by Moody, no, no statistics from Ring study, nor the George Gallup Jr. study. Uh, excuse me, we actually have 32% for a life review from the George Gallup Jr. study. So we see that these are characteristics that are common among pretty much all those that experience the near-death experience within all of these major studies. So the fact that these experiences are common over and over and over again seems to point in the direction to verify, uh, seems to point in the direction that these near-death experiences are real and that it's reasonable and responsible to conclude that these people are indeed experiencing survival of self-consciousness after death which would seem to point to a trans-physical, trans-material dimension to the human being. Now, we have our four kinds of objective evidence that leads us to conclude these things are really happening. So we have to ask the question, what's the cause of these experiences? How do we sufficiently explain these near-death experiences? There are two possible explanations the natural or physiological explanation, and then the transphysical explanation. The natural or the physiological explanation asserts that perhaps the root of the cause, the root cause of these near-death experiences is a physiological cause, such as lack of oxygen to the brain, morphine-like induced drugs to the patient during, uh, during re resuscitation efforts, or maybe just the severe stress of the trauma could give rise to these near-death experiences. But the problem with with this naturalistic or physiological explanation is that all the patients that were clinically dead, they all experienced the same physiological things. They all had a lack of, lack of oxygen. They all had morphine-like induced drugs. They all experienced the stress of the trauma. But yet, only a certain amount, a certain percentage of these people who were clinically dead experienced near-death experiences. Here's what Dr. Von Lamo writes in regard to the weakness of this naturalistic or physiological explanation of the near-death experiences. He writes as follows. 
Our most striking finding was that near-death experiences do not have a physical or medical root. After all, 100% of the patients suffered a shortage of oxygen. 100% were given morphine-like medications. 100% were victims of severe stress. So those are plainly not the reasons why 18% had near-death experiences and 82% didn't. If they had been triggered by any one of those things, everyone would have had near-death experiences, close quote. So the fact that only 18% of the 344 patients of the study, oh, actually, no, um, 300, uh, okay, all, yeah, 344 patients who had experienced clinical death, only 18% had the near-death experience. If there was a physiological root to that experience, they would have all experienced the near-death experience because they all experienced the same physiological condition. Lack of oxygen, morphine-like induced drugs, stress of the trauma. But they didn't all experience it. Therefore, it cannot be, it, the root or the cause of that experience cannot be physiological. There must be some other explanation. And that is what led Von Lamo, as well as many others, to the transphysical explanation. And that is, this theory or this explanation refers to the fact that there has to be some transphysical or transmaterial dimension to the human being that allows for self-consciousness to survive bodily death. Something to the human being that transcends the material world thus allowing survival of bodily death and a continual post-mortem capacity of sight, hearing, uh, walking through walls, and all sorts of other things. Now, this explanation seems to be supported by all of the empirical evidence that we just looked at from the major studies, as well as the weakness of the naturalistic or physiological explanation. So the only, seemingly, the only reasonable and responsible conclusion on how we are to explain these near-death experiences is that the human being has some sort of transphysical, transmaterial dimension, what we traditionally refer to as the immaterial human soul. So this is how we can use uh, the near-death experiences from these major studies in order to argue for the existence of the immateriality of the human soul, that man is not merely matter, but that he is indeed a transcendent being. There is something to man that is transcendent, something beyond matter, beyond the material world. And it is from that fact, as we've already seen, where it leads us to all sorts of other conclusions, such as the immortality of man, right? The possibility of a heavenly existence in the afterlife, right? And even a human happiness or levels of human happiness that go beyond the physical world and physical pleasure and the possession of material things, right? If we are transcendent beings, well then happiness is not confined to this world. But happiness lies in that which is transcendent. And even from this transcendental nature of the human being or the human soul, we can also reason to the existence of God as well. In light of our transcendent desires for the five transcendentals, you see? All right. So that concludes our argument for the immateriality of the human soul from near-death experiences. Remember, it does not prove it, but it does corroborate very well the philosophical arguments. Finally, we come to the last section of tonight's talk, and that is just answering a few common questions. The first question that I would like to answer is the question in regard to the survival of maybe plants or animals after their death. The survival of uh, plant souls or animal souls. The question is often posed as, you know, why is it that we say the rational human soul of the human being survives bodily death, but the soul of a plant and the soul of an animal does not? Now, that question perhaps might sound a bit absurd to you if you're not familiar with the philosophical understanding of a soul. 
traditionally dating back all the way to Aristotle, right? Uh, the philosophers understand a soul simply to mean that which makes a thing what it is, or the form, getting back to the form, right? The soul being basically the, that which makes a material thing organic, or a living material thing, as opposed to something that's non-living. The soul is that life-animating principle. You might be thinking, well, man, a plant has a soul? <laughs> right? Well, the philosophers just simply refer to the soul as the life-animating principle. That which makes that material thing a living organism organism. So the philosophers distinguish between three types of souls. The soul, the vegetative soul, which is the life animating principle for plants. The sensitive soul, or the sensory soul, that is the soul of an animal. That which makes an animal a living thing distinct from a living organism such as a plant, giving it more powers than the vegetative soul of the plant, right? Because the vegetative soul gives the plant the power powers of nutrition, growth, and reproduction. The life animating principle of an animal includes those powers of the vegetative soul, but it has even more such as sensory powers, sight, hearing, taste, feel, etc. And then you have the rational soul of the human being, which is qualitatively different than the sensory soul of the animal, the vegetative soul of the plant. That's the philosophical background from which the question comes. Why or how is it that the rational human soul survives bodily death, but not the vegetative soul nor the sensory soul of the animal? And this has all sorts of implications as well. Does Fido go to heaven? Does Fido live after this life, right? Okay. <laughs> so why do we say the vegetative soul of a plant and the sensory soul of an animal ceases to exist when that plant dies or an animal dies? Well, the answer is this. The powers of the vegetative soul and the powers of the sensory soul are entirely dependent on the matter that the soul is animating, okay? The vegetative powers and the sensory powers are entirely and completely tied to the material stuff of the thing, okay? So let's just, let's just take the powers of the vegetative soul of the plant, the powers of nutrition, growth, and reproduction. These powers are entirely tied to, connected to, dependent on matter, right? What is nutrition and growth? It takes in bits of matter and alters it in such a way, right, to nourish the thing. What is reproduction? It involves a trans transforming of bits of matter into something that's like into the thing that's doing the transforming. Notice how these powers of nutrition, growth, and reproduction, they're entirely connected to the matter, entirely dependent on the matter. Let's look at the sensitive powers of the animal soul. These powers are entirely dependent upon the physical organs through which they operate, right? So for example, the sensitive power of sight is entirely dependent upon the physical organ of the eyes. The sensory power of hearing dependent upon the physical organ of the ears. The sensory power of taste is entirely dependent upon the physical organ of the tongue, right? Even the, even the power, the, the power of the sensory, sensitive soul of the animal, the sensory soul of the animal, the power of locomotion is entirely dependent upon legs for certain animals or fins for certain fish or wings for certain birds, right? And so we see that for the vegetative soul and the sensory soul, their operation, their powers are entirely tied to, connected to, dependent on the material stuff of the thing. However, the rational human soul, as we've already demonstrated tonight, has a certain power that is not performed or operated through a physical organ. Such as our intellection, our intellectual power, when we know and understand the form of triangularity and the form of man, when we extract these forms, begin comparing and contrasting ideas, when we begin to understand things, that act of understanding is not taking place in and through a bodily organ, such as the power for sight, hearing, or taste does. And so the idea is this. In regard to the sensory powers and the vegetative powers of the soul, 
whether it be for, you know, uh, for like for example for the man, or let's just look at the vegetative power of the plant, sensory powers of the, of the animal. Because these powers are entirely dependent upon the matter, when the matter goes out of existence, well then the powers have nothing to operate through. And so the soul goes out of existence as well. If the operation, if the powers of these types of souls are entirely dependent upon the physical organs of the thing or the material makeup of the thing, whenever that matter goes, well then there's nothing to carry out the function of those powers. And so it's reasonable to conclude that those powers cease to exist as well. And because the vegetative soul and the sensory soul only consist of those powers, well then the soul itself goes out of existence with the matter. Okay? But in contrast to that, the human being has powers that are not exercised through bodily organs. In particular, the brain. We have immaterial powers. We have powers that are not entirely dependent on matter. And if we have a power that, if we have powers that do not require a physical organ to operate, if we have powers that do not operate through physical organs, well then guess what? When those physical organs cease to exist, the powers still can exist. They still can remain in existence because they do not operate through the material stuff as does the sensory powers and the vegetative powers of both the animal soul and the plant soul. And so as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, because it does not op operate through a physical organ, it can be a subsistent being apart from the material stuff. Because action follows being, right? Action follows the nature of a thing. So if the operation or the action of the intellect is not through matter, well then, it's not matter in and of itself and therefore can exist apart from matter. Because action follows being. Okay, so that's basically some, somewhat of a summarized form of a philosophical answer to why the vegetative soul of a plant, the sensory soul of an animal, would cease to exist with the death of the plant and the death of the animal, but the rational, spiritual, human soul would not cease to exist with the death of the human being, you see, but that it would continue to exist. Uh, the next common question. Question number two. What about the evolution of man? Okay? Because when we're talking about the human soul and man, the question of evolution inevitably comes up. So how do we answer this question about the evolution of man? D did man evolve according to the scientific theory of evolution? <laughs> well, the first way that I would answer this question is that Catholics, you know, just speaking to a Catholic audience here first of all, Catholics may believe in the scientific theory of evolution, not evolutionism or Darwinism, but the theory of evolution in as much as, you know, the biological development of species and com going from less complexity to more complexity, the changing of material things, the evolution of biological entities, we can affirm the scientific theory of evolution as long as it inquires about the origin of the human body and does not exclude or preclude the existence of the immaterial soul. So in other words, we can believe in the scientific theory of evolution as long as it is not a materialistic theory of evolution, reducing man merely to matter. Once again, we can accept it only in as much as it inquires into the origin of the matter of man, the, the human body, but not in regard to the immaterial soul. Okay, here's what Pope Pius XII in 1950 stated in his encyclical Humani Generis. 
he writes the following in regard to the scientific theory of evolution. For these reasons, the teaching authority of the church does not forbid that in conformity with the present state of human sciences and sacred theology, research and discussions on the part of men experienced in both fields take place with regard to the doctrine of evolution. In as far as it inquires into the origin of the human body as coming from pre-existent and living matter. For the Catholic faith obliges us to hold that souls are immediately created by God. So what Pope Pius XII is saying is that we were permitted, it is possible, for us to believe in the scientific theory of evolution only in regard to the origin of the human body coming from pre-existing living matter while acknowledging that God directly creates the immaterial human soul. And whenever you have the immaterial human soul and matter in a composite unity, you have the first man. Okay? So we can believe in evolution in regard to the origin of the human body while acknowledging God's direct intervention in creating the ra immaterial rational human soul and not reducing man merely to matter. Further, he goes on to say that within the same document that we can believe in the evolutionary process of the human body only in as much as we do not assert it's by blind chance. We have to include the infinite intelligence directing and guiding this natural physical process of the evolution of the human body from pre-existent living matter. So in other words, what Pope Pius XII is allowing one to believe is that God could have directed the evolution of a living organism to such a complexity that it would be ready for to be informed by a rational human soul and thus have the first man. Now, is Pope Pius XII saying, this is church teaching and you've got to believe it as a Catholic? Nope. Is he denying the scientific theory of evolution in regard to the human body? Nope. He is denying an atheistic or materialistic idea of evolution. But he's not denying the science of evolution itself. That is the explanation of certain living organisms through natural physical processes. Only if we acknowledge that those natural physical processes are in some way directed by the superior intelligence of God. Uh, the second way that we can answer this question about the evolution of man is as follows. Because the rational soul of man is immaterial. Remember, we, we established that already, right? Because the rational human soul is immaterial, guess what? It cannot be confined to material, natural, physical processes. R remember, man, human being, is a body-soul composite. A substantial unity. One act of being. Man is not soul. Man is not body. Man is body-soul composite, right? So, if the soul of man is immaterial, and that which is immaterial cannot be explained by natural physical causes or uh, evolution, well then man as a composite being did not evolve, right? This is why Pope Pius XII would say that we can accept the theory of evolution only in as much as it inquires about the origin of what? Not man, but the human body. So hypothetically, if God directed the evolution of a living organism to such a degree of complexity that it would be ready to be informed by the rational human soul, is that material living thing that evolved man? No. It's a material living creature within the animal kingdom. But it's not man until it's informed by the rational human soul. It's not man until you have soul and body composite. So man as a body soul composite did not evolve. Amen? Because man has an immaterial soul which cannot be confined to the natural process of evolution. So man as a whole did not evolve, although we can assert 
that God directed an evolutionary process of what would become man, namely the human body, a living material creature, getting to such a degree of complexity, ready to receive the rational human soul. And when that living thing, whatever it may have been, would receive the rational human soul, that would be the first Adam, that would be the first man. That act of informing the matter by a rational human soul would be a direct act of whom? God. It could only be a direct act of God, metaphysically speaking. So, that answers the question of evolution. We're permitted to believe in the theory only in as much as it inquires about the origin of the human body from pre-existent living matter while acknowledging a direct intervention of God creating the rational human immaterial soul to inform that living creature and thus have the first man. Finally, we come to the last question. Okay, Carlo, you've been saying that the mind is immaterial, not reduced to mere matter. That the mind is distinct from the brain. That's what I've been arguing all night so far. But the question that comes up is, well, if it's distinct from the brain and it's immaterial and not identical with the brain, why is it that when the brain is damaged, our intellectual capacities are impeded and prohibited in some cases? Why is that the case? Why is it that damage to the brain can affect intellectual capabilities? Well, the answer is because, once again, man is a body-soul composite. Man is a unified being. He is one being. There is one act of being that involves a unity of body and soul within that one act of being. And so it's to no surprise that the body is going to affect the soul and the soul can affect the body. Because in philosophy we talk about the human soul being the form of the body. They are so united that the human soul is the form of the body. Just as you have the form of the triangle, right? The form of man, the form of this table or the form of tableness. The human soul is the form of the body. They are united in such a way that they constitute one being. For example, when I know something, it's not my soul knowing, okay? My soul gives me the power to do that, but it's not my soul knowing apart from my body. It's me knowing. I am knowing. I, Corlo, who has both soul and body united, right? When I grow, which I don't do anymore, by the way, <laughs> or when I digest my food, right? Is it my body that grows? Is it my body that digests food alone? No, philosophically speaking, it's I who grow. I who digest food, right? Because I, Carlo, am not just my body. I am not just my soul. I am a body-soul composite. Consequently, it's to no surprise that the body can affect the soul, right? Because of this unity of the true. And so damage to the brain could affect the intellectual capacity of the human soul. Keep in mind, the human soul doesn't operate, or the intellect doesn't operate through the human brain, but the intellectual power of the soul does in some sense depend on the brain and on the human body as a whole. Why? Because we're a body-soul composite. Let me, let me sort of illustrate this with a metaphor and then we can conclude. Some philosophers compare the intellect and the body unity, the soul and the body unity, with a driver of a car. If you take the example of a driver of a car, that driver is not absolutely dependent on the car for his or her locomotion and movement, right? Because the driver could get out the car and move on his or her own powers. But as driver of the car, in that driver car unity, in that driver car system, if I may say, that driver is dependent on the car for his or her movement. And if the car is damaged, the driver's movement is what? 
impeded or prohibited, perhaps. But only in as much as he or she is the driver of the car. In the driver car unity, the driver is dependent on the car, but although not absolutely. Does that make sense? Very similar. The intellect, that uh, power of knowledge of the human soul, as the body-soul unity goes, as form of the body, as united to the body in that system of body-soul, the intellect is dependent on the body, right? Remember in the driver-car system? As driver of the car, driver is dependent upon the car for locomotion, right? In the body-soul system, in that unified system, the soul is dependent on the body. Easy enough? For its intellectual operations. But just like the driver is not absolutely dependent on the car, the intellect is not absolutely dependent upon the body. And just as driver of the car, the driver can be impeded in its movement if the car is damaged, so too in the body-soul system, the intellect can be impeded in its operations if the body is damaged. In as much as they are unified in the body-soul unity, the soul will be impeded in its operations if the body is damaged. Just like in the driver core unity, the driver is impeded in his or her locomotion or movement if the core is damaged. But in neither case, the driver nor the intellect is entirely dependent upon the car or the body. Does that make sense? Okay. So we understand we have no problem with saying that the body can affect the soul and damage to the brain can affect, impede, or prohibit the powers of the intellect. Because by virtue of that body-soul unity, the intellect does depend upon the body in that system of unity, but not absolutely. And therefore, the soul could indeed exercise those powers once it separates from the body, just like the driver can still achieve movement once separated from the driver car system, or that unity. So although there is correlation between the mind and the brain, that, that does not mean that they are identical. There's correlation between the driver and the car in movement, right? One is going to affect the other, but that doesn't mean they're identical. So too in the body-soul system of that unity, that unified system, although there's correlation between the two, the body affecting the soul, soul affecting the body, that does not necessarily mean they are identical. And so this mind-body problem can be solved in light of the traditional understanding of the soul as the form of the body and that composite unity constituting one act of being, namely the human person. Amen? <laughs> All right, so hopefully uh, you've learned a thing or three tonight. I know it's a, a bit intellectual and it's a bit heavy and requires a little intellectual stamina, but hopefully there's a few things in there that you're able to um, assimilate into your own intellectual uh, capabilities and share it with others. So that concludes our talk for tonight. Is man more than matter? And so let's close with a prayer. Is, so what's the answer to the question? Is man more than matter? Yes. <laughs> okay.